Welcome to Primity, where we find simple techniques to help address modern problems for our primitive bodies. My name is Andrew Pafford, and I'm a health and wellness professional with over a decade of experience helping Olympic-level athletes, desk jockeys, and seniors achieving their goals and improving their quality of life. Thank you for coming back from our exciting cliffhanger from last episode where we discussed injury. As you will recall, we discussed the mechanisms of healing and ways that we tend to interfere with that. This episode, we're looking to pick up where we left off and discuss techniques that will speed up healing. We'll be referencing the healing processes from last episode and translating them into actionable steps we can take with simple tools likely already at our disposal. So since we've mostly destroyed RICE, the acronym for Rest, Ice, Compression, and Elevation, let's talk about what we can do to help facilitate the healing process. Seeing as how compression was the only thing that made sense from our RICE acronym, let's hone in on that for a moment. Compression can be done around the injury site so as to not cause further harm, but actually provide benefit to healing. I've linked an article in the show notes full of fun facts about massage regarding healing, so definitely worth a peek, but we'll be discussing some of those finer points here. So for example, if I stubbed my toe, Massaging the bottom of my foot near the toe will help promote circulation in and out. Pressing on the skin pushes what's known as interstitial fluid out of the area. So for example, if you lean against something for a period of time and then come off, you'll notice that you now have the pattern of whatever you were leaning against seemingly imprinted in your skin, albeit briefly. This is simply the act of pushing interstitial fluid out of the tissues. Because our bodies are predominantly made out of water, including our cells, if you were to squeeze them like a sponge, that fluid would leave those cells. But if you then let go or stop squeezing the sponge, over time that fluid will creep back in. So that creeping back in is because of negative pressure. So fluid from the surrounding area will be drawn back into the negative pressure space or filling those cells back up. In our case, lymph from the site of swelling will be drawn out towards the negative space and out of the site of swelling. So if you create a negative space adjacent to an injury site, that will encourage the swelling to leave from the site of injury and towards the site of negative pressure. Further, Our lymphatic vessels are similar to our veins in that they contain one-way valves. Lymph in the vessels cannot travel backwards, so to speak, because of these valves. So when we're massaging near an area of injury, say our toe, to continue the previous example, we aren't running the risk of trapping or pushing swelling into the site of injury and just kind of passing it back and forth it can only be encouraged along its course, in this case, out of the injury site. This is also how ice may contribute to healing, by using temperature to manipulate the blood vessels. Say, if we were to apply and remove and apply and remove ice every couple of minutes or so, what we would be doing is causing the blood vessels to dilate and constrict repeatedly, which in turn, creates a pumping mechanism using the blood vessels themselves. So when the blood vessels constrict, they're pushing what fluid is currently in out, and then when they dilate, they're drawing fluid back into that now negative space created in the larger blood vessel. So leaving ice on an area for an extended period of time, not so good as that restricts circulation. However, using it intermittently for shorter periods of time could be beneficial. Additionally, the massage can help create increased blood flow to the area. Massaging or applying physical pressure can temporarily create occlusion or blockage of blood flow to an area. And at face value, that would seem bad, if not for a fun little reflex in the body called post-occlusion reactive hyperemia. In layman's terms, after a blockage of blood flow, the body will compensate by dilating the blood vessels in that area to over-inundate those tissues with blood flow as if to try and make up for lost time without circulation. This means by tapping into the reflex, 
we can use the massage to increase blood flow to certain areas, albeit transiently. This would sound quite useful to an area undergoing healing and needing good blood supply, no? Finally, massage can help in turn can help in returning to normal function for surrounding tissues. Because of swelling, coddling, and altered use of a limb, it's not uncommon to create other aches or pains that may not be a direct cause of the injury, but rather from the altered lifestyle involving that injury. If I stubbed my toe, you can be darn sure that I'll be altering my gait to try and baby that toe so that I don't step on it. Walking in an unusual fashion can mean stressing other parts of my leg that aren't used to walking in that manner or working that hard. This can lead to the surrounding musculature to getting aches and pains and possibly feel like they're seizing up due to the increase in abnormal use. It would be unfortunate if, just as my toe were starting to feel better, I strained my calf and was right back in the infirmary, so to speak. So in many regards, using self-massage, or even a professional massage for that matter, can help reduce swelling, increase blood flow, which in turn speeds up recovery time, and potentially stave off further loosely associated injuries. Now, of course, all the while healing still needs to take place. As one may also surmise, wound healing is extra work for the body. It's already energy intensive, just keeping us up and running on a daily basis. It's an added stress to be active and patching ourselves up at the same time, like trying to build the plane and fly it at the same time. This means our bodies require more resources than normal. Most of our tissues are composed of protein, or at the very least, the building blocks of protein, amino acids. On top of the energetic demand of the immune system to help clean out damage from the injury, our bodies need to go through the lengthy process of rebuilding healthy tissue, which means utilizing more amino acids as well. For this next bit, I will now reference a nice piece of literature called Nutrition, Anabolism, and the Wound Healing Process, an overview by Dr. Robert H. Demling. Aside from covering different responses to stressors, starvation versus the fight or flight response, Dr. Demling discusses how during wound healing, our need for proteins is increased, and as such, we tend to pull from our protein stores. We all know that fat is stored as fat in the body, but do you know where protein is stored? Aside from being functional at moving us around, our muscles also double as protein stores. This means in times of great protein need, our bodies will actually catabolize or break down our own muscles in order to fulfill protein needs elsewhere of a higher order. This means if your nutrition is lacking in protein while you are recovering from an injury, then your body will cannibalize its own muscle tissue for the sake of self-preservation. This can also explain why when a number of people undergo surgeries, they're not just weaker from sitting in a hospital bed for a couple days on end and succumbing to atrophy, but if they're not eating adequately, their body's also cannibalizing their muscles even faster, leading to much greater muscle loss and strength loss after a surgery. Dr. Demling further elaborates by providing some formula to help determine your nutritional intake based on severity of injury. For protein, I'll quote him by saying, quote, Increase protein intake to two times the recommended daily allowance, which currently is approximately 0.8 grams per kilogram a day, increasing it to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day to allow for the restoration of wound healing in any lost lean body mass. Now, for those of us not on the metric system, that would mean increasing from approximately 0.36 grams per pound of body mass per day to 0.72 grams per pound of body mass per day. For example, if yours truly is 180 pounds, which at the time of this recording I certainly am, my daily protein intake would be 65 grams of protein, and I would need to increase that to 130 grams of protein a day. Now, as someone who's trying to gain lean mass, that's not a tough pill to swallow, and I at least strive for that on a daily basis already. So the numbers certainly make sense for someone who is undergoing 
anabolism, or trying to create tissue. In this case, trying to repair a wound. For those steeped in the bodybuilding community, I've seen and heard numbers as aggressive as one gram per pound of lean mass, which would be slightly higher than the 130 number that I said for myself. I know personally that's a tall order to accomplish without drinking seven protein shakes a day or eating half a cow, but I digress. Additionally, Dr. Demling goes on to discuss how energy intake could increase based on the severity of the wound. He proposes that the energy requirement would equal BMR, your basal metabolic rate, times your activity factor, times your stress factor, in this case, the severity of your injury, and provides a table to give an idea of what that stress factor should be based on the severity of the injury. Minor versus bone fracture versus infection versus major trauma like being burned all over, etc. The long and short is if your body is going to be working harder, you need to be fueling it adequately. If you want to bounce back as fast as your body is physically capable of, then you'll need to be feeding the machine. You can't expect a construction project to finish on time if the materials don't arrive when needed. While on the topic of nutrition, let's talk about another fantastic supplement that might not be so good in this particular instance, and that is omega-3s. By and large, omega-3s have become a bit of a go-to for supplementation. There's plenty of literature out there that shows omega-3s anti-inflammatory properties can be just as effective as NSAIDs, like ibuprofen or Tylenol, without the nasty side effects, like destroying your kidneys and liver. Omega-3s prevalence in our diet, or rather their diminishing presence, has led to an increase in popularity of its supplementation, and for good reason. For those consuming way more omega-6s than omega-3s, then your incidence of all-cause mortality tends to increase. So supplementing with omega-3s is not a bad idea given the current state of our food. However, supplementing with it during injury might not be a great idea, and not for obvious reasons. I'll reference another study, Omega-3 Fatty Acids Effects on Wound Healing by Jody McDaniel and others aimed to see, this, to see the effects. In a traditional randomized double-blind study format, which gives a study good power, two groups of participants were given soft gels with one have, containing omega-3 EPA and DHA, which are the crucial active omega-3s that our bodies need, while the other group was given a placebo for four weeks. Both groups, one with the omega-3, one with the placebo for four weeks. Blood of the omega-3 and omega-6s were measured in both groups to indeed demonstrate that the supplements did create a statistically significant effect in the patients. So the patients who received the supplement, their omega-3 levels jumped like crazy and their omega-6s were slightly suppressed, while the placebo showed no change to their omega-3 and 6 levels. Further, a suction device was then used to create blisters on the forms of both groups, and fluid from each blister was then extracted and its contents studied at two different points in time, five hours after blister creation and 24 hours after. Three inflammatory markers were then measured, IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, all of which are inflammatory markers that are big, big indicators that there is an injury. What was surprising was 24 hours after blister creation, IL-1 beta was staggeringly higher in the group with the fish oil. So in spite of its anti-inflammatory properties, the group taking the fish oil had higher inflammatory markers involved in the wound site than those on the placebo. What's more, the total time for complete wound healing ended up taking one entire day longer in the omega-3 group as opposed to the placebo group. While it may not sound like much, the authors did point out that these blisters were not very large. So a whole day variation for such a small injury could be extrapolated to a number of days in regards to a larger insult. 
So if you're supplementing with omega-3s, and most of us ought to, given the current situation of our food sourcing, be cognizant that you may want to suspend that if you sustain an injury or are getting prepared to undergo a surgery. I know most doctors already recommend people to halt omega-3 supplementation because it also acts as a blood thinner, so they don't need you bleeding out on the operating table. But in this case, another reason might be that it would take you longer to bounce back from the surgery. While we're on the topic of supplements and injury, I want to pull out one more at-home use that could have potential. Turmeric, or more precisely curcumin, has also been bandied about for its anti-inflammatory properties, among other benefits. While some recommend its supplementation to control inflammation through oral ingestion, others may want to be weary of its effects on testosterone levels. Turmeric inhibits the enzymatic steroid 5-alpha reductase, which is big words, but all you need to know is that it has a huge role in converting testosterone to dihydrogen, or excuse me, dihydrotestosterone, the more active and potent form of testosterone. So in some cases, that could be good, in others, bad. So be sure to have a conversation with your doctor before supplementing with that. However, back in injury land, Turmeric actually has a long history with wound healing in India and China. The Western science appears to be catching up, or at least validating, excuse me, at least validating these claims by exploring how turmeric, or more precisely curcumin, interacts with the body at various stages of the healing process. However, in a classic example of putting your money where your mouth is, one study used turmeric cream for women who had just undergone a cesarean operation. Participants were placed in three groups, an intervention group that used the turmeric cream, a placebo group, so they received a cream but there was really nothing in it, and a control group where they just healed up like everyone else does normally. Measurements were taken 7 and 14 days after the operation. After just one week, the mean score between the intervention group, those who got the cream, and the placebo group, who got the fake cream, the mean score of swelling was three times less. And the mean score difference between the intervention and the control group was nine times less. So those who received the turmeric cream had nine times less the amount of swelling than those who received nothing at all. And of course, those findings were found to be clinically significant. They further go on to cite other studies that corroborate their findings as well. So other studies that found that turmeric had a clinically significant impact on healing. So I would suggest taking a closer look at those studies to see what other additional benefits turmeric can have on healing. Now, if that alone got you excited and you're looking to quickly jump into obtaining some cream and lathering up, Let me curb your enthusiasm a little bit and preface that with a little warning that most turmeric creams are sold as aesthetic products on the internet, which are not held to the same stringent standards as medicine. There have been plenty of incidents of heavy metals being used in beauty products, and the FDA does not need to provide approval before products hit the market. So before you go slapping some salve you acquired from some unknown origin from the internet on an open wound, Think for a moment if you could be doing more harm than good. I've included a link to the FDA website about a survey done on beauty products and their findings to help provide some more background and education. Especially if you are a user of beauty products, it might be a good idea to give that link a quick peruse. That said, if you are wanting to try this, but want to go about it in a smart manner, the best option for a quality product is something you know where every single ingredient comes from, aka one you make yourself. With a cursory search, there appear to be ample recipes online for how to make a turmeric cream or poultice for wound healing, typically consisting of nothing more than turmeric and water. And it should go without saying, don't rush to try this if you aren't sure if you're allergic to turmeric or not. If you've never consumed it, making your first exposure to it where it can be introduced directly into your bloodstream wouldn't end well if you do indeed have an allergy. So be smart and take the appropriate precautions. And of course, finally, as a reminder, I am not a physician and cannot substitute one. 
So please be a responsible person and speak with your doctor. Now, recap time for today. We discussed the mechanics of compression and the different physiological effects it can have on speeding up healing time and the mechanisms through which it acts upon. How the metabolic demand of healing increases and why getting adequate protein and increased injury is crucial to letting the body heal optimally. How some anti-inflammatory supplements like omega-3s might actually work against quick healing and exploring how turmeric may have beneficial properties in regards to healing and ways to explore utilizing DIY turmeric salves and poultices. That should wrap it up for today. Hopefully you learned a good deal of information that was not common knowledge, possibly debunked some bad conventional wisdom, and are now better equipped to help yourself recover in times of injury. We're always curious to hear what you're curious about, so send us your questions, comments, and feedback to info at primity.org. And as always, strength comes in many forms, from within and without. So be strong to be useful. Until next time, stay strong.